Uh, and we're live. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another new SPSM chat. SPSM. Just SPSM now, I guess, right, Hudson? We're not suicide mm -hmm. prevention social media anymore. SPSM chat. Coming to you live by Rudy Caceres. We're all about that spism chat, yo. Oh, I don't know. We're, off, we're off to a good start. This is what oh. happens when we don't have a guest and it's just me, Joel, and Hudson. So... <laughs> Tonight we're to, we're answering your questions, and by your questions I mean Joelle and a few others who are our biggest fans. So, but if you still want to ask us a question, that is totally fine. I'm I'm sure we'll have plenty of free time to do some bonus questions. So, if you're on Facebook, Facebook.com/slash Rudy Caceres. If you're on YouTube.com slash SPSM chat, did I just say Facebook.com slash Rudy Caceres? If you're on the watch, if you're on the watch party that I just shared, ask your question on the um, the original SPSM post. So Facebook.com slash SPSM chat, Twitter.com slash SPSM chat. The video should be pinned to the top of our Twitter account at S. SPSM chat and mixer.com slash SPSM chat. Uh, we, we just gained some followers on Mixer thanks to Joelle being on past co host Marie's show. So shout out to Joelle for doing that. We just passed 1,000 followers on our Facebook page. And for the longest time, that was really okay. ignored. Twitter was, was the only real account that was really getting pushed. And I feel very proud about that. We're able to really boost up the Facebook page and we're the first iteration of SPSM chat to actually live stream on Facebook, as well as these other wonderful social platforms that are all equal in love of us. Speaking of love, love. If you're watching this live, please let us know that you're here. Let us know where you're from. Let us know that you care by using that hashtag SPSM chat. If you're on Facebook or YouTube or uh, Periscope, we can also put your questions on screen, kind of like this. So if you're on Twitter, we can't do that, but we have another solution. I can actually <coughs> time warp over to Twitter. Dilly. There we go. That's, we're, we're great. We're great with the. Uh, thank you. Okay. So let's. Oh, we got. Okay. Introduce yourself on the Twitter. Okay. We want to hear from you, where you're from, and all that good stuff. If you're getting uh, college credit, we want to hear that as well. So let's get right into the swing of things. Let's go into our round rectangle, however it may look. <laughs> and I guess uh, I, I'm very bad at this, you all. So I'm going to introduce myself. First, hey everyone, my name is Rudy Caceres. For those who don't know, I am Rudy Caceres. <laughs> I, uh, I've been doing live streaming all the way since like February of 2017, my God. So, and I started hosting SPSM chat, took over the reins back in August of 2019. We are almost at our one year anniversary. I'm so proud of that. So you can also follow me at Rudy Caceres on Twitter, where I mostly just retweet at SPSM chat. That's totally fine. But you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from our lovely co-hosts. So let's take it to Joelle. Um, hi, um, my name is Joelle Murray. I am a certified peer specialist. I am currently not employed as a certified peer specialist, but that's my thing. That's, um, that's my training and that is my career, I guess. It's a way of living, advocating and supporting others. Um, and uh, I am autistic, I have OCD. Um, and those are kind of the lenses through which I see and advocate and um, push for equity. Next up, Hudson Harris. I love oh. your hair right now. Can I just, can I just say that? Can I just interrupt? <laughs> that yeah. is you, uh, you have come a long way, my friend. The COVID way, yeah, it, uh, it just has started to go up not left, not right, just straight up. Uh, so yeah, we're just, we're just gonna lean into that. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Hudson Harris. I am a behavioral health system designer living in sunny San Diego, California. As you can see, it's quite sunny. 
I work with governments and nonprofit institutions on things like culture development, system design, product and service design. On the private side, I help companies go to market and how to bring all this beautiful technology we see out there into behavioral health where it belongs to help people. I'm very excited to be here and throwing it back to you, Rudy. Well, before you do, I'll tell the whole world, what do you plan on opening up next week, Hudson? I, what? What are, you, what are you planning on opening up in, in San Diego County? I don't know. What do I? Uh, uh, beaches? Parks? Restaurants? Dog parks. Dog, dog park, park, please. Yes. Yeah. We, uh, dog parks are going to be open. San Diego uh, was one of the first communities next to LA and San Francisco that did the uh, stay at home order. And it really showed. We, we really flattened the curve out and really proud of that. And so now we're getting to start to open stuff up. Hopefully we get to have nice things and continue to stay open because if you care about the people around you, you should be home and wearing a mask when you have to go out and only then. Yes. And I, I see that Joelle wants dog ice cream parlors to open up as well. Get on that Hudson Harris at mental strategy on Twitter. I will Rudy Caceres at Rudy Caceres at SPSM chat. Question number one, and it is a doozy. This question comes from our very own Joelle Marie. Joelle Marie has to ask, what are alternatives to involuntary hospitalization and police involvement in crisis situation? What say you, Joelle Marie? So I thought the order was a little different, but sure, I'll go. <laughs> Okay, um, so I am a peer specialist, as I mentioned. Um, a part of, you know, a big part of being a peer specialist is not um, leveraging power. That's like a, a extreme violation of the ethics and um, what being a peer specialist uh, revolves around. So, you know, if, if I want to support someone and I, I want to um, be with them in crisis and support them outside of crisis, then I'm not going to be able to report them and do something that they would not want done. So calling the police, putting them in a situation where they have their power taken away, having anything done to them versus supporting them and things that they want done, that's that's out of, that. that's not an option. Um, so what can we do? You know, I, I've always found for me and for a lot of people I've talked to, when we escalate by taking away power, by assuming, by forcing anything, we don't just escalate like our response, we escalate um, the actual crisis situation. And so we escalate the danger for everyone involved. We um, diminish people's uh, sense of security and stability and safety. So when people think they're making me safe, by using restraint, by using force, by telling me what I'm thinking or telling me what I, I need, they're they're making me feel unsafe and they're putting me at higher risk and they're putting themselves at higher risk because it makes me feel like I have to um, try to survive and that they're an enemy. And that's fair if somebody wants to tell me what they think is right for me and it's not. Um, so what we can do, we can honestly just sit and be with somebody and that might mean that person is across the room and we sit and be with them from across the room and people are going to argue what if they have a weapon what if they have this what if they have that and i could go through every single little detailed situation but if you want to force people to do stuff you're going to come up with a way to do it if you want to just respect people you're going to come up with a way to do it so you can respect people. You can always find a way to de-escalate the situation and empower people and <laughs> respect their agency and truly listen to them. And if you give them time, then they will find a way to tell you what they need and you can listen. Um, I've done, you know, courses. I don't want to name the courses, but um, there, there are trainings that revolve around simply listening and de-escalating in that way. And these are courses that are done in psychiatric hospitals and the staff always ask, you know, um, what if you're with somebody who's violent, who's, aren't you gonna get hurt? And no, like you encourage violence if you use force. That is the response, don't use force. Speaking of right for me, let's get to Hudson Harris. <laughs> Okay, that was your best one yet, Rudy. Um, so 
I I want to start with the with the concept of agency. I'm I just as a as a preface, I am not a behavioral health professional. I just play one on um, the internet apparently. Um, but I what I do work in is how to design systems, and I've done everything from suicide prevention. Uh, mobile crisis, jail diversion, psychiatric emergency department diversion, and different stuff from a uh, design standpoint and also legal standpoint. And so I think one of the things that took me a while to really get my head around was this concept of, of agency. And like I knew it conceptually, but it was really uh, Desiree that helped me really understand that the ability to impact one's own life, even if that is contemplation of suicide, is something that is agency and not something that should be taken away. So, I mean, I think that it's really important at a core root level to preserve someone's agency. With that in mind, you know, what I wanted to talk about tonight is the work that I do, which is really focused on how do we get to people, uh, how do we intervene before uh, they get to a place where they're going to be subject to, you know, involuntary commitment. If you, if you look at the communities that are using um, police as their mental health responders, which is the vast majority, the national average is around 50%. So half the time the police come out, you're going to jail, you're going to the hospital. Um, for communities that use mobile crisis operations, uh, the kind of standard level for community-based diversion rate in that same populace is 90%. So 90% of the time, people are going to stay at home, which is the ideal thing. Um, generally speaking, in communities that use mobile crisis really effectively and well, that's integrated with a hotline, the only time mobile crisis rolls out is when there's not a risk of violence. And then that other 10% of the time, they're either getting connected to services, getting a handoff, you know, warm handoff to a, a FQAC or, or a provider. You know, the other thing that's important is, is that how we're doing um, emergency department work. You know, I've, I've talked with emergency department doctors, uh, chiefs, heads of EDs, and almost universally, the general sense and feeling is, is they are not given the tools nor the uh, training and expertise to be able to actually manage and handle behavioral health emergencies that are in a hospital. As a result, we're on a, you know, if we're on a spectrum from care management to, to risk management, uh, everything in the United States is moved towards risk management. So rather than someone spend time with the individual to do a evidence-based assessment and create you know, a treatment plan that's set up for them to succeed, the knee-jerk reaction is, well, we're not 100% sure that they are going to do something, so send them to inpatient. And this tendency to risk manage um, as opposed to care manage is one of the core, core nuggets and core problems. And so there, you know, there, are, there isn't really a lot of really good data out there about how we're going to track and manage psychiatric emergency department diversions. But you know, the programs that I've been involved in, um, at their best, were around 83% to 80% uh, ED diversion, meaning 83% of the people that were going to the EDs um, were going back home same day and were not admitted. You know, there's there's a word that I want to introduce everybody to, um, which is one of my favorite weird words. Yeah, iatrogenic. Iatrogenic is where you get a disease or an illness that is related to the treatment that is worse than the underlying cause. So for me, that's really the challenge behind psychiatric diversions and those types of work is that it's an iatrogenic effect. Putting someone in a hold for 72 hours keeps them alive for 72 hours. Your highest risk of suicide is 30 days after discharge from a psychiatric inpatient unit or from a psych, uh, a, a psych engagement with a uh, criminal justice system. So the iatrogenic effect, the word of the day, uh, is really where that comes in play. Hudson, has there ever been a time where we disagreed with each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question number two, and it is a doozy. What is the betrayal of suicide LD in film slash TV slash books, uh, video games, macrame that was realistic or helpful and not harmful? Thank you to past SPSM chat guest Anya Burchek. Glad I got that right this time. So thanks for that question, Anya. I appreciate you. And again, if you're just joining us, uh, feel free to ask your own questions. We see you on, on the Twitter, okay? We, we know when you're naughty or nice, so just know that. And, you know, let's just get into this. Actually, um, I should answer these, huh? There's only three of us. What am I doing? Joelle actually, <laughs> Joelle actually has to come back and ask her, Yes, yes. Um, do do do. Okay, so do you want to make your point first, Joelle? Or, okay. 
Awesome. Um, but yeah, that was, I thought that was the agreement that it was going to be Rudy and then me and then Hudson and you were going to answer all of them because there's only three of us. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so but, used to but, be, having nothing to say. So I have to yeah. get into that mindset again. But, um, but that wasn't the thing that I was going to say. The thing that I was going to say, which is a controversial thing that like people don't want to hear is, um, is something that I bring up when I say like, you don't have to use force is that sometimes people um, are intent on taking their lives and we can do everything we can think of. But if we are doing, if we're just meeting them at that point of crisis, then they will take their lives. They will find a way. And that's, nobody wants to hear that, but you can force people all you want but if we are not, or we're not meeting them before they reach that point, we're not helping them before they reach that point, we're not improving their quality of life, then they will die. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Joelle. Sorry for bulldozing over you. Um, <laughs> I, was, I, was so, I was so wrapped up in trying to joke with Hudson as I often fail at doing that I, totally forgot that you had something to say. So I'm glad that you got to say that because it is very important and I'm sure Hudson agrees as well. A hundred percent. Yes, okay, so let's get back to our question number two. Okay, so here's my answer, N none of them. I have never seen a TV show, movie or anything like that. Maybe you out there in social media land will disagree and that's totally fine. Usually it gets like four out of five elements right or They'll, it'll be a good heartwarming story, but just the whole language is just completely offensive or they glorify the means, even though the characters are well-intentioned and good acting and everything, good writing. It's just so hard to put all the pieces together in a way that satisfies everyone that it's just never going to happen. I guess it, it, that's just the way it's going to be. But I feel that we are obviously getting better. Let's say that first. But... It's just a long way to go if we ever get there. Because like I said, there's a thing called artistic license. So we as suicide prevention advocates, we might have one way of saying, this is the way to tell the suicide prevention story. Whereas a director, screenwriter, author, what have you, might have a different way. And who's to say who's wrong in, in these uncertain times, but I'm sure that Joelle will have something to say as well. I rhymed. Joelle as well. Mm. Um, Joelle is awesome. That doesn't rhyme. I know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I really can't think of a portrayal that was not harmful. Um, I do, you know, people are going to disagree with me, but I do, I do think that there are definitely aspects. Well, well, okay. But that was not, I can't think of a fictional portrayal that has been not harmful. Um, <laughs> I just can't, uh, you know, and I think, I think that things that wouldn't be harmful are things that Things that present people as human beings with more than one dimension of existence. So they are not just a diagnosis and they are not just this, this one thing, this, this one event in their life. They're all the things that they have done in the world and, and the things that have happened to them and those decisions that they have made. And also, you know, their interactions with the people around them and also like a representation of the things going on inside them. And there's not a lot of narrative that, that encompasses all of that. And that also encompasses like for me and for a lot of people that I know in, in the suicide prevention community who have experienced chronic suicidal thoughts or an experience in an attempt or experience loss, we have a kind of morbid a uh, sense of humor and and for me I can't speak for anybody else it's necessary because if you are 
completely uh, serious and in that dimension of darkness all the time, you you lose your strength. And I think that, you know, in a lot of fictionalized portrayals of hard things, uh, people are afraid to explore that very real thing where we can't live in darkness all the time or we get lost. And I just, those are the things that I would like to see in something. Yeah, no, and that's that's good to also mention is that it's, we there are, there are things that we'd like to see that we're not seeing. So <laughs> there, there, there are ways to improve is what I'm trying to say. I tried to respond to the question in some way, even if I couldn't think of one that answered it. <laughs> Well, that's what I like about you, Joelle Marie, is that you fear no question. Okay, let's go with I like that. other things about you too, just so we're on the same page about it. <laughs> yes, awesome. Um, someone on Periscope said, Hannah's story in 13 Reasons Why seemed realistic. Okay. <laughs> Hudson, question number two. Yeah, I, so first off, Rudy, you didn't answer question one. Um, fuck the police. Fuck the police. Uh, I mean, I agree with what Joelle said, and like, I really struggled to try and find um, a show I thought like well represented. Um, I mean, as much as you can, the suicidality, and uh, I couldn't really find any that I felt did did it justice or did it right. So what I did instead is I found movies and things that were on mental health, which I thought addressed in pieces some of the topics and things because I think. The vast majority of what we see out there are negative representations of mental health in, in Hollywood uh, and, and TV and whatnot. And so, you know, some of the movies I thought that have done a good job, I think A Beautiful Mind um, did a good job at presenting a fairly whole picture of the character that Russell Crowe played. Uh, good Will Hunting, I think, you know, showed really well what Matt Damon was going through with his abusive past as well as his, as his brain stuff. Uh, Rain Man is always in one of my favorite movies. Um, I know that that it's his, it is contentious at times as well. Uh, and then the one I would say is the one that probably has been the most impactful for me as a parent on mental health is Inside Out, um, which really helps kind of directly hit on some of the core emotions that kids feel and adults and how, uh, how to look at them. So that's, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, thank you, Hudson. I appreciate you. You were missed the past few weeks. A lot has changed in the world of SPSM chat. We've got two new co-hosts, two have left us, and yet you remain alongside Joelle. How do you keep going with all that you're doing in the world? One of the hardest um, working people I know. Well, thank you. I, you know, this is one of the things that fills my tank. Um, I love to see uh, both of you. I love to be on here and talk to people. And, you know, it was one of the very first times I think I've ever felt that type of um, fulfillment in something that was, you know, I love giving talks, but that's so, I mean, really rare if you think about how often we go to conferences, especially now. Um, and I look forward to SPSM every week. Um, it's one of my favorite things. Well, thank you, Hudson. You know, I'm always worried as someone who's pulling all the strings behind the scenes is that like all my co-hosts are going to leave me because like I'm stressing them out and like doing so much. So it always makes me feel better Yeah. when I hear from people like you who are like, yes, bring it on. Overwork me. Make me do things I'm uncomfortable with. Yeah, thank you, Hudson. Over, Rudy. Question... <laughs> Question number, we can't edit that out. Question number three, and this comes from Youth Mental Health Canada. Shout out to Youth Mental Health Canada. Hope to have you on SPSM chat soon. Big friend of the show. How can colleges best prepare to support incoming first year students who may have experienced trauma as a result of the pandemic? I'll have you know that when I was putting this in Hootsuite, Hootsuite warned me about sharing uh, false information on social media. So. Keep an eye out for that, okay? Joelle Hudson, don't piss off Hootsuite. Okay, so better prepare. Okay, so the, the, th the thing is, is that in these times, these uncertain times, there's, there really hasn't been anything like this um, where you have these high school kids who graduated amidst the pandemic and weren't e even able to graduate on stage. Like some of them, this, Warn, like, probably, I, I don't know, like there's just so many ways that this can go 
and I don't know every school story if like some of them, they made people retake high, uh, the senior year or a lot of people fail just because they couldn't keep up with working from home just because they were never set up for success with that. Um, it's, it's just so, it's so bizarre and just so robbing of people when it's just such, such an important time in their life and this is what they get no prom no homecoming all that stuff uh just your first day of school and college is at home you can't even go to a dorm just really sad so you can imagine that there's some built-in trauma and distress already cooking and brewing and then you go to this new college this new university no matter where you are in the world like how does one cope with that how does how does one get into a mindset of, okay, I'm in college now. This is what college is like. This is not what college is like. This is, this is bad. There's no way around it. So how, how can colleges pre better prepare for this? Well, uh, Youth Mental Health Canada mentioned this in their tweet, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing some of your uh, questions just to fit it all into the graphic and to uh, the tweet limit. So Colleges, they shouldn't be so alarmist where they should treat everyone who's coming in like they have some mental illness and everything. It sucks. How everyone coming into college or everyone in general isn't just like completely traumatized by this whole pandemic is beyond me. So I want to stress to people working at these colleges and the higher ups, professors, deans, uh, administrators, just really, really try to see this from the human side and not just as diagnostic labels and anyone can be put into a hold or sent home or not sent home, but you, you know what I mean? This really, really, really pay attention to the individual about what their needs are. Try to work on some patterns that are actually happening and not assuming too much going in because it's so hard to, to predict anything right now. So to all of you, Going back to college, you are all my heroes. Okay, I wish you all nothing but the best. What say you, Joelle? Um, <laughs> I think this is kind of a tricky question. Um, I think, I think I, so. Hmm. So trauma can. I'm trying to think about how to phrase this because I just lost it. But sometimes when we frame things as trauma, it creates the trauma. And I, I'm not sure how to phrase that appropriately, but if, you know, we, we diminish resilience. And that's not to say like that we should diminish how completely distressful and fucked up all of this is, because it all is. Um, and that's not to say that people don't need support and that we can't acknowledge what is going on and how it's really disrupted a lot of things that we've known, uh, a lot of things that we expected life to be in the future and, and how things will change. Um, and I think that we also, you know, and this is for colleges and this is for everyone everywhere, we have to acknowledge that people are not experiencing this the same. I'm not experiencing this the same as my neighbor. Um, but that's weird. But like, I'm not, I'm not, even, I'm not experiencing this as the same as the person across the street. Um, and I'm certainly not experiencing it the same as a person um, in the middle of rural farm country. Um, I'm in Los Angeles, uh, by the way. But um, I think that, you know, if colleges really want to support students that they need to offer services to students and offer um, individualized options, but not force them. So not make it obligation that students have to seek counseling or students have to do a certain thing. And I'm not sure what's going on with my camera, but that students have to do X, Y, Z to be able to go to classes or be able to um, find ways that they can excel and succeed. And uh, that's what they should always be doing, but particularly now. Um, definitely ask students what they think they need and follow their lead. What say you, Hudson Harris? I want to highlight what Joelle said right there at the end, which is this is what they should always have been doing. Like, the thing is, is that if you think about when, you know, 18 years old hits, you've got, you know, your highest chance of 
uh, uh, different conditions developing. You've got your um, your prefrontal cortex is doing all sorts of weird things. You're maturing at all different rates. Like that is such a core critical time that we should be doing what Joel said, which is all of this. We should be doing you know proactive outreach that's non mandatory. Uh, you know specifically to COVID, providing telemedicine and telementoring um, appointments. Like kids that go to college, they need very specific and structured supports um, and therapy. Like raise your hand if you've ever been told you have to wait more than two or three months for a therapy appointment while in college, like if they even offer it. Like I remember when I was in college, it was three months and it was off campus and there was no insurance. Um, the thought that a college would send you to a therapist that didn't take the insurance that they required you to buy makes me want to rage panda all over the place. So, you know, take care of your kids, like reach out, talk to them, engage with them, like real mentorship programs, not just one mentor with 30 kids. Like, Colleges have to invest in their kids. They have to invest in mental health. It's not just for the for the success and well-being and mental health of them, but it's also for the success and well-being of the university. Like, you've got to start doing some of those things, and it's even more urgent and more pertinent now than it has been ever. But the baseline should be that type of service. That's what we should be providing. I, I thought of one thing that we do disagree on. Well, I think. I think my dog anime is the greatest dog that has ever lived. And you disagree with that. I do. I do. Yeah. But this goes to show the, uh, the, the uniting power, the unifying power of SPSM chat. It brings people together who have opposing views. Mm -hmm. Right, Joel? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we're, we are making good time. So let's get straight to question number four. For those who are joining us right now, hey, welcome. This is SPSM Chat. We talk about suicide and suicide-related things every Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Got to get used to saying that. So we usually have on expert guests like we will have on next week, which I'll announce at the end of the show. But right now it is three awesome people, if you count me. And I love these two people, Joelle Murray, Hudson Harris. I'm Rudy Caceres. Let's get into question number four. And that would be, how do we address the upstream issues that can contribute to death by suicide and not just rely on intervention. And that was a question asked by Bill Cork on Twitter, who, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is a relatively new fan of SPSM chat. So thank you. We, uh, we love it when new people join us. So it looks like you're doing good work and have some good um, perspectives on suicide. So welcome. Welcome into the fold. And this is something that I personally like talking about too, these upstream issues. Uh, what that means basically is all the things that we could be doing to help people way, way ahead of time from the per the time that the person is on the bridge or on the cliff or anything like that calling 911. And that's what suicide prevention should be. And uh, I'm not a big fan of intervention in any way. I know there's people who participate in SPSM chat who work for organizations that do interventions, that do active rescues. And I'm hoping that by doing this show that I can provide some insight from the lived experience, not just me, but from my co-host and guest of why that is not a great solution at all, at all, 100%, not at all. So we need to normalize talking about suicide. We need to make sure that people can express themselves, whether by telling just in, in a circle, either uh, with a support group like Alternatives to Suicide or even their closest friends without people getting weirded out about it or being able to express themselves through creative writing, art, what, what have you, theater, without people thinking that like, oh my God, this person needs to be locked away because they're suicidal. Same thing with self-harm. Like we need to see it more as a coping skill, not necessarily the healthiest one, but something that people are doing, not specifically to, with the intent to kill themselves from that very act of self-harm. So things like this, things that we should be talking about and normalizing that we're not, 
for whatever reason, I don't know why that's not being talked about more there. Hey, it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Did you all know that, Joelle Hudson? Yes, I did. There we go. And um, we, if you yes, didn't know, more, we have we have an episode for you next week. Again, more details to come. But I want to hear Joelle's perspective now. Um, thank you. How do we address the upstream issues that can contribute to death by suicide and not just rely on intervention? Uh, so, as a like, as global existence, we need to uh, really invest in resilience. And that means valuing resilience, um, researching what makes people resilient and what can strengthen resilience. And that's not just people that we choose to identify as at risk. That is everyone. Because I do think that this panic and fear and emergency sudden response to everything that we consider abnormal comes from this sense of this lack of resilience that that we tend to have and this fear of lack of control and you know if if i mention that i'm having suicidal thoughts i've had so many experiences where a clinician is just ready to slam their hand on the red button and that's not what i need and it is never helpful for me and for a lot of people it's never helpful because if they are sitting in an office calmly saying, hi, I'm having these thoughts and I'm asking you for help and support. And the first response is to decide things for you and take away your right to have any control over yourself or your body or what happens to you. They're not going to reach out again. And also, like, you don't develop coping skills that way. You don't develop techniques and skills and and um, play on your strengths if somebody takes everything away from you. And those responses from clinicians, from family members, from the world, comes from this fear that we can't do things to help people. People won't ask us, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about death? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Because they are scared. We need to <laughs> approach this fear and think, we can do things to help people. We can do things to help people that will play on their strengths, that will give them tools, and that will not take their life away from them. That's it. Everything else comes from that. And I'm done. Hudson? Hudson? Yeah, I, uh, I'm a big fan of investing in the social determinants of health uh, indicators upstream. Um, you know, the, the causes of suicide are super complex and multivariate and um, really tough to predict in any sort of persistent and consistent way. But, you know, we do know that investing in a, in a, in a kid's education, investing in uh, access to everything from healthy food to quality transportation, um, teachers, all of those things improve educational levels, improve confidence, and improve a lot of the things that can help people later. I think I'm saying the same thing that Joelle is saying about resiliency, but like we, you know, we're willing to defund programs we know impact uh, in positive ways our entire society, like Head Start, like pre uh, preschool, like all of those things. Um, and I, I really think that if we're gonna move the needle upstream, it's starting to invest in kids at a really, really young age. Why? Thank you, Hudson. We are we are just plowing through all of these. I, I so since we actually have some time, we had a bonus question from Dr. Catherine Gordon, who was also a previous guest, and I think this is a great, good question to end on. And feel free to extrapolate as much as you like. And her question is: I didn't even have a chance to make a graphic, but it was basically, what gets you through the hardest times when you're in crisis? And for me, it is you, Joelle. You get me through the hard times. He told me the same thing. <laughs> no, shut up, Hudson. This is our moment. <laughs> you invited me to be here, literally. So, no, but no, but seriously, it does help to have you in my life, Joelle. For those, for those who don't know, spoiler alert, Joelle and I are married. So, <laughs> I just... We are? Yes, still to this day, almost not, two years. 
So me, I just want to say thank you. Don't do that. Thank you, Joel, for all you do to really help me when I'm feeling at my lowest. And thank you for all that. And also shout out to our dog, Anime. We are a unit. So I'm glad I was so lonely without you. And even even though anime has always always existed in the universe throughout all time, and also apparently our yet to be had second puppy, I'm glad that you came into my life, and I'm glad that you're here with me, co-host of SPSM Chat. By all means, you do not solve all of my problems, nor do I expect you to, but I feel good. good. <laughs> I feel good that when I am at my lowest that you're there, you're kind of stuck with me, especially in this whole pandemic thing. We can only go so far from each other, but I'm glad that we got each other. So thank you. Hoot, hoot. I'm <laughs> Let's take it to our co-host, Joelle Marie. Um, well, thank you for that moment of vulnerability on this very public platform, Rudy. Um, but it is true that anime has always existed. Um, Rudy will ask me, do you remember before we had the puppy? And I said, no, this is, this is not a thing. We've always had the puppy. Okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so what, uh, what was the question? What gets you through? Yeah. What gets you, what, what gets you through times of crisis? What gets me through times of crisis? Honestly, like one of the big things is karaoke and not like, and it's not, and like people don't believe me about this, but this is really like, it very much is. And it's a combination of like all the, like all the actions and feelings around it. It's that there's, you know, half the people are there and they've done this thing. Like they have their songs and they're in their groove and they're feeling like really good. And like some of the people are there and they've never done it and they're really nervous and they end up doing really well. And like, and they have like all these like mixed feelings of like anxiety and they've suddenly done this like surprising thing that they didn't know that they were good at. And also, you know, a, most karaoke places you go to that aren't like elitist and shitty, um, everybody's there to like, just have a good time. Like if you totally suck, <laughs> it doesn't matter because you can't really suck at karaoke unless you're just there to be an asshole. <laughs> like, um, so really it's, it's the act of like going and just enacting these feelings and making noises <laughs> And, you know, you can stand far back from the microphone and yell into it. And um, and I'll, I'll be honest, having a drink or two helps. And that's my coping thing. I'm not recommending it, but that's what I do. Um, so doing that and then like having this space where people are just there to like express, make noise, get it out. And then that like the physical rush you get from it, like really helps too. And, and so all of that together is, a huge thing for me. Um, and sometimes like I'll try stuff I've never done before that I thought I wouldn't be able to do. Sometimes it sucks, but that's honestly a way for me to get courage and and the skill of trying new things that are scary. So like this little simple thing that I say like karaoke is a mental health tool for me, it's real. Um, so that, and then uh, having my puppy lay on my body like a weighted blanket is a big thing. And uh, a swearing and making noises is another big thing. <laughs> so those are my, oh, and painting. Painting acrylics, like chunky acrylic paintings. What is your favorite duet song? Really? No, what's your favorite solo song? <laughs> Everybody knows you already know your duet song. What's your solo song? Like, what's Wait, your what? Really? I'm Everybody... Rudy asked because he already knows the answer. Actually, I, 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 don't, I don't think he does. I don't, um, think, I don't think I do. At this, do at not... this point, uh, it's... Pardon me. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the newlyweds game. <laughs> <laughs> He's so productive. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, we're uh, probably bored with shit out of people. Uh, but no. write your answers of your duet song. Write them, and we'll show at the same time. No, um, we're not going to do that. That's not this show, Hudson. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to like 
Well, we'll, we'll save that for SPSM after dark. Yeah, um, after hours. Yes, I know. I, I, lo I love how our viewership spiked once we got into this section. So that just goes <laughs> to show what brings in the ratings. But what so, is your song? What's your go-to song, Joelle? Or what one of your go-to songs? Right now, my personal go-to song is Hit Me With Your Best Shot, Pat Benatar. Ooh, that's a good one. And it's really fun. And I can do it even when like I have a cold or allergies. And I do it really well. You get I honestly do it really well. Allergy, oh, you yeah. That Benatar yeah. stretch, yeah. I can do Piano Man very well. And oh. some early, my Homes in Alabama by the eponymous group Alabama from the 70s. <laughs> I also do stuff like I'll do Mustang Sally oh. and uh, I do Mac the Knife. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I but, can do uh, Gloria Rainers, I will survive pretty damn well. If I, do I can't do I that. I can't do that. It's like the I can't do the range. <laughs> But we did, we actually, we did time after time one time, time oh. after time one time, and it was really fun. It was like <laughs> one of the funnest, most ridiculous things because I was like acting stuff out. <laughs> time after time. Yeah, seriously. Yep. Try it. Rudy, what's Good. your song? Um, I Love L.A. by Randy Newman. Oh. <laughs> I Let's like be it. honest. Are we, yeah. how's Twitter doing? <laughs> yes. Oh, there's no one, yeah, it's, Dude, get your shit together, Twitter. Okay, don't get me started on that. Okay, well, so there are people saying stuff. Anything of note, Joelle, while we're here? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, in response to question four um, and to uh, Bill Cork's question, uh, I can't remember the specific wording. Stuff about like uh, uh, upstream stuff, like dealing with upstream issues rather than just relying on intervention. I know that wasn't the exact question, but that was the meat of the question. Um, so Jen at questioning Jen said, uh, universal basic income, reinvention of the welfare state. Uh, I'm not, I'm, people mean different things when they say that. So I'm, I'm just assuming it goes with all the different things. So, but she said, uh, universal basic income, community health, strengthening of Medicare, investment in social housing, um, employment protection and living wage. Like, I feel, I feel like those are definitely things to address. And that is something that uh, Hudson brought up in not so many words. Um, but I, I also think that, you know, social determinants of, of health, wellness, uh, linked to quality of life, and also uh, definitely linked to resilience factors, like being able to have a sense of resilience, practice it and strengthen it if you do not have. So if you don't have health insurance, if you don't have a sense of stability, you don't have that space to practice fucking up. Mm -hmm. Like you, you don't have that safety. So you can't, you can't do things you don't know how to do. You don't have that safety. You don't have that ability to bounce back. You don't have that ability to be like, this is a skill I don't know. What if I screw up? Oh, well, I'll be able to try again. No, what if I screw up? Oh my God, I'll lose my house. I'll lose my shoes. I won't get any more shoes. I won't get breakfast tomorrow. Like that's, <laughs> but we we found out you can actually build and strengthen resilience. So like, what if people had, you know, universal basic income, they would have this room to fuck up, meaning that they can find out how they screw up and then not do that and do the things that work. And we build like better society where people are free to learn how to have a quality of life. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Who thought? <laughs> yeah. And my, my apologies, people on Twitter. I, I see your tweets. Thank you all. I appreciate you. Um, actually, let me just give you some quick shout outs before I forget. Um, yeah. I think, I think you were, you, they just weren't like, Coming yes, up um, James Michael, Bliffle Splick, Amber Cannon, um, Julie Wells, Katie Gordon, one of the best people that ever lived, Youth Mental Health Canada, questioning Jen, I see you. Okay, all right, and great great all around. Let's, uh, let's connect Youth Mental Health Canada. I want to get you on the show soon. There we go. So it's time for final thoughts, as the tweet says. Um, I just want to say final thoughts. There we go. I'm... Wait, Hudson can answer. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> okay, we are not on final There's thoughts. There's only three of us. Just oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, well, we, we went off on like, so many things. Um, Hudson, first and foremost, can you open the karaoke <laughs> bars now? 
Yes. Because this Zoom karaoke shit is not cutting it. Yeah. Good Good to go. You yeah. have to bring your own mic, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Open up the Pat Benatar bars. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is that is that it? Uh, okay. What is that what gets you to times of crisis? Making yeah. phone calls? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Talking to you. Humor. Exercise. I know. Uh, SPSM helps a lot. And then I find that when uh, I'm in times of crisis, I have to do things to keep my hands busy. So I make things. I taught myself to chain mail during one of the last big crises I had. That was fun. Uh, and woodworking. Um, how to, uh, it helps me to physically create something um, when I'm really, really sad. And then like good music and good food. When you said chain mail, I automatically thought of chain letters. <laughs> I was like, that's not something you want to learn. No, no, I'll stick with chain mail, uh, which is better, I think, so. Okay, um, all right, so let's get on to final thoughts. And I guess that would be my turn. So again, thank you everyone for the questions. Thank you for everyone who participated in the Twitter chat on Facebook um, and YouTube as well. Um, Go, go. If you're watching this later on the day, later on the week, that's totally fine. Still feel free to leave a comment, even leave a question. I usually check them throughout the following week. So just know that if you're late for whatever reason, I know there's a lot going on, a lot of things to choose from for your Sunday evening entertainment. So just know you can always go back, leave a comment, share even. We love it when you do that. So I, I'm just glad that we're able to have this connection with all of you where I say, ask us your questions and we get some really good ones. I didn't see any junk at all. So <laughs> that's a plus. So we hope to do more episodes like this and I hope to do better next time with actually saying things. So it's so, it's actually so weird. I did a Facebook live for the mighty a few days ago where it was just me talking for like an hour. And I was like, Oh my God, like I, I actually have to have things to say. So I, that was good practice for tonight. So I'd like to think I did a good job, right, Joelle? Yeah, yeah, all right. Final <laughs> thoughts, Joelle? Um, yes. Oh yeah, so there was, there was a question on uh, Facebook, I think that uh, I kind of wanted to address, but I'm kind of like iffy about it, but I'm gonna address it as a peer specialist, I guess. Um, and it was, you know, how do we address the conversation about suicide in communities such as Latino, Latinx communities where the basics of mental health are not even understood? In other words, how do you talk to someone about suicide when they don't even know what depression is? And I think well, we didn't really address this generally in the show because we weren't, we just saw the question today. Like we just went to review the question today and we weren't really entirely sure how to interpret it. And we didn't want to be like interpreting different questions. Um, so my take is kind of like, how do we, how do we support people if, if there isn't like a, a general consensus on what support is or, or what, what the prop problem is, like what the distress is. Um, that's kind of how I interpreted it. And I hope that's understandable. Um, so as a peer specialist, um, somebody's first of all gonna, and, I just feel like it needs to be addressed generally because there's so many different cultural interpretations of extreme distress, of any distress that would make somebody say, this is so extreme, I need to escape and how I'm gonna escape is by taking my life. Um, and as a peer specialist, uh, I'm not always gonna share a cultural lens with somebody who is saying that they want my support or that they want me to sit with them in their distress. and. Ideally, that would be the case, but that's not always going to be possible. And I am white and I come from a Catholic and general Christian background and I am not those, but that's what I grew up with. So, and my mother is a nurse. And so there was medical terminology in my family constantly. Um, but, you know, I would come at it with asking the person to tell me what is going on, like how are they feeling in whatever language is comfortable for them. If they have to use colors, if they tell me how they're physically feeling, if um, you know, if their breathing has changed, if they're having different thoughts than they usually have, like what is making them feel 
how they're feeling. And if they think it doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter. We can talk through what that means now for them and how is it comparing to how they usually feel. And also just learning about the person and how they are seeing things um, versus how I would see the same thing. So it's really, really important if you are trying to approach things like people taking their life in a community that is not yours or even in a community that is yours, but that is not a a common conversation. And um, I don't wanna dictate this, but how I, how I engage with it is to just talk to people about the extreme distress that they are feeling and find out in any way you can what they need and how they need to talk about it. And don't tell them how to talk about it because it doesn't matter what you call it or what the diagnosis is in that distress. You want to get them what they need and what they tell you they need. Okay, that's my final thought. <laughs> Thank you, Joelle. And, and and I mentioned it earlier, but you were a guest on Marie's Anxiety's Mixer stream. She did a show for Global Accessibility Awareness Month. So I really appreciate you flying the SPSM flag and talking about <laughs> things. I, I mean, just give some highlights real quick about the things you talked about and why they're important. Ooh. Uh, hoo, hoo, hoo. To put you on the spot. I wish you had warned me. Um, so, I mean, I, I just kind of talked about uh, me being diagnosed as autistic and, uh, you know, how it, uh, Jesus, to like, just, um, so it definitely, you know, it happened later in life and it, it, the way it happened for me, I definitely think happened differently because of how I present. I'm, you know, I'm supposedly very intelligent and like, uh, there's there's an issue that happens like or has happened historically with autism where if kids are verbal at all at any point like they supposedly can't have autism and that's just been a misunderstanding of the superficial reality of autism and so it, you want me to like tell you it <laughs> no <laughs> like no that, that's that's so, that's totally no, I, okay so so basically i just talked about you know diagnosis issues misunderstanding um not believing people about their internal environment and then denying them accessibility, um, denying them access, denying them support and denying them validation based on what you think and how much they discomfort you rather than giving them an opportunity to um, be the best them that they can be based on what they are reporting to you about their experience and their needs. Does that help? <laughs> yes, final thoughts Hudson. Um, I would, there's not really much else I would add to what Joelle said. Just, I would really encourage people just be willing to sit with people who need you. Um, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to problem solve, but the, but the concept of active listening and just being present can literally save a life. Um, the research supports it to the nth degree. So don't be afraid to sit with somebody who needs you. Um, sometimes that's really all they need. And sometimes it's more, in which case you listen and, uh, help when they need it. And I, I know you don't have Hamlet with you, but for people who might be scared, like, oh my God, what happened to Hamlet? Can you just give a quick update to make to alleviate people's fears? Hamlet, uh, the porker, has hit 80 pounds. Um, he put on about 30 pounds in two months. We're gonna call that his pandemic poundage. <laughs> uh, he's, he's doing well though. Uh, he had his first beach trip, which I don't, is on Instagram, at Sir Hamlet Pig. Uh, you can see a pig zoomy in the water. It's pretty cute. Pandemic poundage. That sounds like a movie that's not safe for work. So that's oh, going to <laughs> wow. not. I mean, that's after dark material, really. Yes. So that is actually the pandemic porker poundage, specifically. Before before this completely runs off the rails and we lose all our sponsorship, Everyone, I'm sorry. I just want I just want to. Hey, there's still people hanging in there. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who watched this week and contributed. Sorry, Next, mom. Next Sunday, May 31st, the final day of Mental Health Awareness Month, we're having on, again, the co-host of Suicide and Stuff, Desiree L. Stage, also creator of the Live Through This Photography Project, and Jess Stolman Rainey, all-around badass, who you saw only last week. I mean, if I had it my way, we just have Jess Stolman Rainey on every week. Sadly, Can I, that show? Can I be on that show? Yes, it's oh. booked. There we go. Wait, it's booked as in no? It's full? No, I mean, I mean, like, no, it is yes, now because booked. because I already said I was going to do yeah. it, so. The gates have closed. <laughs> so it is going to be 
<laughs> I, we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to have Carly on again too, but whatever. Okay, so thank you all to everyone. Go check that out. We're basically just going to be shit talking Mental Health Awareness Month for an hour, maybe two. So thank you all to everyone. And remember, Hudson, give the sign off line. Keep your piggies close. And your mental and health. Is that a thing? <laughs> is that a thing? <laughs> it is now.